Hi, everybody. I am Ed Kramer, the chair of the SIGGRAPH Pioneers Group. Every year, we invite someone uh, really special to be a featured speaker. And this year, we have an amazing featured speaker, Donna Cox. And I'm going to introduce Donna in just a second. At the end of this session, we're going to open it up and anyone who wants to we're going to let you into the meeting and you'll be able to wave and we're going to do screen grabs of everybody who's on. Uh, if you don't want to participate in that, please, all you have to do is just not turn on your camera. I'm going to tell you some stuff that's, that's right out of Wikipedia. Donna Cox is an American artist and scientist and a recognized pioneer in computer art and scientific visualization. She has an endowed chair as professor of art and design and is director of the Advanced Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And that's going to play a big part in what Donna's is gonna talk about tonight. Um, she is also the director of visualization and experimental technologies at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. She's the director of the eDream Institute, which is the Illinois Emerging Digital Research and Education in Arts and Media Institute. She was awarded the ACM SIGGRAPH Distinguished Artist Award for Lifetime Achievement in Digital Art in 2019. She was nominated for, get this, an Academy Award for her work on the IMAX film Cosmic Voyage Donna was an art director for the IMAX film, A Beautiful Planet. She helped visualize galaxies for the IMAX film, Hubble 3D, and collaborated with the uh, producer on the galaxy shots in Terrence Malick's film, The Tree of Life with Brad Pitt, which also Douglas Trumbull, our speaker from last year, worked on The Tree of Life. So little coincidence there. Um, Donna collaborated with the NCSA and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, another coincidence. I'm talking to you from Denver, and uh, I'm, I'm friends with uh, the folks at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, and she collaborated to create the film Black Hole, The Other Side of Infinity, which exhibited in 2005. And Donna is the author, or one of the co-authors, of uh, New Media Futures, The Rise of Women in the Digital Arts, which is an amazing book, and we're going to talk with Donna about that as well. And my favorite thing about Donna from all the plaudits and wonderful things that have been said and, and done uh, for Donna, she was honored at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry as one of 40 who were selected modern day Leonardo da Vinci's. So with that, I would like to welcome Donna Cox to our SIGGRAPH featured uh, presenter 2021. Hello, Donna. Hello, Ed. Thank you very much. And thank you, committee, for uh, asking me to be here tonight and to give the presentation. Um, thanks. Um, I've known you many years and a lot of the pioneers. And one of my favorite parts of going to SIGGRAPH is the pioneers event. So going to that event. So it's really great being here. And, and it's an honor for all of us to have you here. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to point out down in the corner here, we've got a, uh, a little logo that is the Pioneers um, little logo that uh, we just came up with that is um, representative of the green phosphorescent lines that used to be on, uh, on displays in the very, very, very early years of computer graphics. So that's what that little bug is down there. I should mention that this is your official retirement party. Yes. Um, that we, <laughs> all the pioneers are getting to share with you. Day two retirement, yes. Day, day two <laughs> of retirement. Um, what, how does it feel to just look back on all of these honors? When I went to Illinois, I just, I was just like, the glove that fit the hand for that particular era. Just looking back on that transition out of analog to digital and looking at the 
that particular time of being at the epicenter of where the visual browser was born, where visualization took off, where supercomputing at universities. I mean, to be there at the beginning of all that was, it was like uh, unreal. I mean, I look back on it and, you know, the Buddhists talk about, you know, just consider it all a dream. And it is all like a dream, like a wonderful dream that took place. And uh, I was uh, enthusiastic and young and and uh, naive and didn't realize I had limitations. So nothing, you know, I see that in young people today that sort of... Uh, uh, just daring and unstoppable and and just taking and seizing the moment and it was such exciting times I mean I, I look at that whole era um, uh, that's what the book is about new media futures the rise of women in the digital arts I mean it really points to this transition especially in Chicago right, right out of analog MTV video and right into the personal computer and and the history of the arts and and the alternative arts that was going on and has always been in Chicago and looking back I love the history and I was part of it and I love looking at history and trying to understand it to know where we're going I could see the future and, and it was just an amazing time and I was just right there with the right people. And I also want to credit, you know, all the people I've worked with. I mean, uh, you know, my team, the current team that uh, Bob and I have left, Bob Patterson uh, uh, retired too, two days ago, and we left our team. Um, and uh, we're already missing those morning Zoom calls, you know. Uh, checking in, what's got to be done today. We had um, have amazing people that we've worked with for most of them many years over. Uh, Stuart Levy, two decades, and and people, uh, even the youngest members are you know nearly a decade. So I couldn't have done any of it without having good relationships with people. You know, we we say we do computer graphics. But it's really people that do the computer graphics and how we treat people and how we collaborate and how we credit them and how we engage and we get excited about the project and give it our all. And so when I look back, what I see are the people that was uh, amazing uh, to be around and to work with. To watch, I mean, we did, you know, Bob and I, the first visualization of the NSFNet, the internet, to be there at that time. We knew in advance, we could see before it was commercial, that it was going to go commercial. We knew that it was a free network at that time. And to get the data and to talk the students into, it was all manual, pulling the data, organizing it making Maya do what you wanted it to do to visualize this data. We were trying to get the data to show for the first time that it was evolving and that to give people a picture of what was going to come so that they could get on the map, get on the internet, you know, use the animation to help raise funds for their university or their institution to get on the internet. So, yeah, I, I look back at this uh, retirement and I think, oh my gosh, what a, a, a glorious years. And I, and I love it and take advantage of it. And I encourage my students to do the same, just seize the moment. You have done so many things and they all seem to revolve around the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana or Urbana-Champaign, I can't figure that out. Um, and, and so how do you, how do you keep it straight? When are, are you doing something today for the National Supercomputing Center? Are you doing something today for eDream? What, what, how, how do all those little pieces fit into your, <laughs> your big picture? Well, today I'm retired, so I have to be separated from the University of Illinois. I will be Professor Emeritus, but yes, 
The National Center for Supercomputing Applications um, was founded by Larry Smarr. That was in uh, my uh, presentation. And it was one of five supercomputing centers that were funded by the NSF that was put in a university setting because prior to those years, uh, the government really didn't trust universities to operate and own their own supercomputers. I mean, that, that was a paper that Smar wrote on the famine of supercomputing in this country. And a lot of scientists had to go to other countries to actually get access to big supercomputers back um, in the 70s and 80s. And again, it was, it was like this digital turn where suddenly uh, academics justified why they needed these supercomputers to be able computational science was a young field and um, so the supercomputing center is where my professor when I graduated from uh, University of Wisconsin um, Madison said uh, uh, you go you go look up this uh, this supercomputing center. There's a guy there by the name of Larry Starr. I'll never forget that. So I went looking for Larry Starr, and it was Larry Smarr, <laughs> really. But um, uh, the, the fact that it was just like, okay, I'm ready. You know, I was writing my own code. I had already um, was a student in Wisconsin with Pat Hanrahan. Uh, he had introduced me to the old Stanford Technology Computer, which is probably putting out enough radiation. I mean, this thing was three feet deep, and I started programming it. So by the time I got to Illinois, I looked up the supercomputing center, and I said, hey, I'm an artist. I'm a visually literate person. People, the scientists really need our skills as artists and and I had digital skills and um, and I went with this idea of the Renaissance team interdisciplinary teams that would solve these visualization problems that would bring art and science together through computer graphics and that's what I wanted to do I mean I had this vision when I was a student that that's where the future was going because I I was looking at art history, and it was very clear that the history of art was uh, artists wanted to experiment with the best technologies of the time, whether it was the paint or it was photography. So I wrote this white paper and I convinced uh, Larry Smart that this was, uh, we, we needed to have these Renaissance teams. and. Uh, and uh, the rest is history. I mean, I started forming teams and it, they were all great scientists, really smart people at the University of Illinois. And I just loved it. I, every day I learned something. I learned about other disciplines. I learned about atmospheric science and as, uh, uh, numerical relativity. You know, it was like I was an artist that could participate and making these um, this data uh, accessible to regular people. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up? I know you you grew up in the Midwest and the kind of well, I, I won't say Dust Bowl era, but but, uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> um, tell us what it was like well. <laughs> growing up. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen because I've got some photographs. Oh my, yeah. Oklahoma, yep. Oh, yeah, that's that that's me a long time ago. And that's my grandmother and my mother who raised me. Um, yep, that's me in the Arboretum in Enid, Oklahoma. My mother, my aunt, my grandmother, and me. And do you know these strong women? Um, my father died when I was four months old as a result of uh, World War II. And I was raised uh, by these women, my grandmother and mother. They were both um, widows. My grandmother widowed. In fact, she outlived five husbands. And my, uh, my mother was widowed. And they 
They raised us two kids, my brother and I, on this old acreage. My mother worked the day shift, and my grandmother the, the night shift, and they took care and raised us kids and loved us. And, um, and they were persistent, and they were determined, and they were uneducated. And they used to make fun of me for being the book learning. You, Donna Jean, you're gonna, you love what, read those books. You love to read those books. And I remember sort of being a strange one out of the family. But I tell you, I knew I was loved. And they made a home and they said, never give up. And I didn't. So I was the first to get a high school education and a college education and a PhD out of the family so wow the, the first to get a high school education in and a not high only school. that you went on to get a phd <laughs> in a high school but my mother never had the opportunity and my grandmother was was born uh and orphaned in a plantation in tennessee as many hardships as they had they were an inspiration we do have a number of pioneers on the line with us so they're contributing questions as well. Have you ever worked on a project that where you were visualizing something and you found something surprising, something that, that you weren't expecting, something uh, that because of your visualizations, there was some kind of new knowledge gained? Yes. <clears throat> well, this has uh, happened many times where we've been working with scientists like Mike Norman. Often uh, when we put things in motion, the scientists see it all in motion, they sort of grok things that they've never seen before in the dynamics of the physics. I think the most impressive one was when we did uh, the uh, in the 2000s, not not the 1989 thunderstorm. That was early on, and the visualization team did that. But in the 2000s, about 2004, 2005, we worked on a tornado with the same team, Bob Wilhelmson's team, and they ran this supercomputing computational model with all the physics and dynamics, and it ran for months on the supercomputer. And then there was this analysis period with people actually who were in Oklahoma who were uh, analyzing this numerical data. And uh, what we did, uh, and it was primarily the teams, Bob Patterson, Stuart Levy, and we were all contributing. We noticed that there was the secondary counter-rotating tornado in the data. So we were locating like finding all through all the spaghetti, finding the vortices of the first tornado, but then we found this other anomaly in the data. And the scientists had to double check it. They, wouldn't, they couldn't believe there was this other smaller counter rotation. And so they went out to the scientists in the field and said to the storm chasers, well, is this possible to have this other uh, tornado and they said yes so then they let us show it because we were working on this for a nova show and they didn't want us to show this other counter rotating tornado until they verified it in the data and in reality so they wow. had to go to the observationalists they had to double check and that's one of the cool things about working with scientists is it's never a direct cause effect there's correlations, and they have to be validated as much as possible, given the limitations of computers and our knowledge. Two tornadoes <laughs> for the price of one. The, the double tornado story. Okay, <laughs> now we have a, a question from somebody I think you will know. Bob Ellis wanted uh, to see if you could talk a, a little bit about the demo that you guys did together in the 19. 80s, I guess the late 1980s at uh, at SIGGRAPH. So what oh, can yeah. you tell us about that demo? All right. And I just showed a short clip of that in the, in the uh, PowerPoint presentation that I did. Yes, uh, science by satellite. 
the televisualization. So we that was one of the most amazing demos <laughs> ever done. The impetus to do this was, and I don't know if you can pull up the diagram or the slide, it was rather uh, sophisticated technology. And AT&T donated a satellite link and we were going to provide the SIGGRAPH audience in three performances, the look and feel of doing science by satellite. Now you have to realize that in 19, late 1980s, this was not possible. What we were trying to show is how you would could run and access a supercomputer and stream big data visualizations in real time. We were giving the SIGGRAPH audience a look into the future. And um, a paper came out of that uh, called Eliminating Distance in Scientific Computing, an Experiment in Televisualization. It was written by Bob Haber, Bob Ellis, Dave McNabb. And, you know, it was rather sophisticated projection of the satellite link with sun microsystems back and forth. We had sun stations at the Boston Computer Museum. We had workstations in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And so we did this remote satellite link between Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, the Boston Computer Museum, people on the stage, SIGGRAPH audience, and we had projections of computer screens showing uh, sim uh, computational science in um, Champaign-Urbana and uh, the results in real time and visualizations on the stage floor. We do this kind of stuff every day now where we zoom and we can remotely access supercomputers and clouds, but not at that time. We were trying to give people the look and feel of what the internet was going to be like in the future and how to do science in a way that was impossible in 1989, but it came to be. And I don't know, there, yeah, oh, yeah, and I found oh, yeah. it. And Warren Hare interviewed Senator Al Gore, and we they played that video before each of the performances. And yeah, look at this Telstar AT and T satellite link. I think I heard someone say it was about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that demo. And there we are on stage with the scientists. Now, you know, I wore this white linen suit. I'll never forget that. Uh, you know, you can look at the technology. It's an amazing uh, setup here. But what I remember is that I got into that cab to come to this event. And the night before, absolutely nothing worked. Uh, Smar and Bob Haber and Mike Norman, all of us stayed up in some Denny's over coffee all night long. None of the technology worked. I remember we were getting a little short with one another. We had a script we were working on, but we didn't even know if any of it was going to really come off um, at the time. And I remember getting to that uh, stage and we still had not seen this work. <laughs> and the SIGGRAPH audience files in and everybody's trying to keep their cool. And I had hopped in this cab and I'd sat and somebody had spilled a cup of coffee in the back seat of this cab. And I sat in this cup of coffee in this white linen skirt that I was wearing. And then I had to get up on stage with coffee all over the back of me with, with the technology that didn't work. But it all worked beautifully, and everything came off just as planned and rehearsed. And we did it for three performances, and it was an amazing experience of seeing the future and letting others see the future. And maybe that's what visualization is about, is being able to enable others to see what you see. And right now, we are living that future because through Zoom, you're sitting there in Chicago, yeah. I'm sitting here in Denver, we are online, 
and and everybody's been doing this you know it, it's it's not like this is some you know marvelous new technology we've all been sitting here doing zoom for the last year and a half um yeah. but uh but and at the time you did that demo yeah. just linking chicago to boston was a major feat and a, and a really expensive feat yeah bob ellis was like coordinating uh he was from sun microsystems all this equipment coming in and they this the satellite link i mean there was all that was taking place. And then Larry Smarr was from NCSA's point of view. Uh, I mean, there, it, it was an amazing feat. People like uh, Ray Adasic were up all night long and, um, you know, everybody put their all into that because if we realized it was just a, a very special moment uh, for everybody. And that we had already gotten uh, the first uh, uh, thunderstorm into the electronic theater, the 1989 thunderstorm. It it was a great SIGGRAPH. And to be there in the Boston Computer Museum with electricity and all the interactive exhibits. And I do remember that was the most expensive SIGGRAPH food reception. They had lobster and shrimp. Remember those days for SIGGRAPH and like when we really had lots of money? I mean, I couldn't believe the spread at that, that particular reception, but it was great. That's, that's great. That's awesome. So you also had a lot to do with early use of virtual reality types of setups. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen lots of footage of, of you and Bob in the cave. So what I want to know, tell us about the cave. And and is the cave still a thing or has VR moved on from there? What's very interesting, I'm so glad you asked this. Uh, uh, first of all, the cave was really put together and invented at the Electronic Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois at Chicago with Tom DeFonte, Dan Sandine, uh, Carolina Cruz Niera uh, was, uh, wrote a library for it. She's in the New Media Futures book. Uh, I, you know, the cave, we cloned it at NCSA and we had the first clone of the cave and there were many caves in the 90s. And what is so amazing is that so much of history overlooks this room-sized, 12-foot square where you could shove a bunch of people in it and everybody could get this shared social experience. And, uh, but it, it was very expensive to maintain. And uh, Jason Lee and uh, Maxine Brown and the Electronic Visualization Lab have next generation caves uh, and uh, power walls and wedges and and there's there's been uh, later versions of it but the cave as we knew it and the applications that we developed for it that Bob and I developed in Marcus Tiebo that was in the original cave and then we translated that technology for virtual director a camera choreography system we translated that into other virtual um, passive stereo environments and tracked environments. So uh, we uh, have, have moved it into the future, but in the 90s, if you go back and look at the history of VR, there's a lot of history online that totally misses the cave and those early VR experiences coming out of ARPA and DARPA and uh, uh, the 90s room size ex uh, experiences like the cave. So I would say the cave as it was in the 90s does not exist. And there's newer instantiations. And VR goggles and headsets and the consumer uh, quality and uh, consumerization of, of VR has really flatten the curve so a lot more people have access to it because you can't to really support a cave was a million to five hundred thousand dollars and so you really can't do that and so everybody gets a vr experience now uh but it it 
it was really so wonderful to be in there as a shared experience in the 90s. And I, I, I think um, just to let people know, one of the things that you were using that cave for, like you said, the, the, um, the virtual director, you were choreographing the camera moves oh, yeah. through 3D environments. So basically you were doing what I do every day with Maya. I create yep. control vertices and put a yep. camera on a control curve. But what you were doing was doing that in real time, live, and moving through your data. Gesturing it. That's what we got the patent, uh, Bob and Marcus, and I applied for a patent. But to gesture uh, and form, fit a curve to that gesture in the cave, and to be able to move around and to see and have all the capabilities like an animation system, but to do it through gesture and voice was was pretty innovative. And, and we did that because we really needed it for the making of Cosmic Voyage, the IMAX movie. We had colliding galaxies and large scale universes and time evolving data. And so really being able to have nice smooth camera moves in through the large scale structures and that data was really important. Tell us a little bit about the experience of making those IMAX movies and and how they've been received and you know how, how that fits into your legacy. Well Cosmic Voyage was um, I mean, it was really the first big IMAX film. It was at, at a time when I was working very closely with Pixar and had the opportunity to go to Pixar at that time. Um, uh, John Lasseter and others, uh, Ed Catmull took me to lunch and I thought I was going to, I had a choice to make Cosmic Voyage back in the Midwest and in Champaign at the university, or I could go work on Toy Story. I mean, that was that was the fork in the road. And at the time, what was so seductive about staying here is we'd never had an IMAX film that had data-driven visualizations in it. All the IMAX films had special effects, but not vet scientifically vetted data. And that was when I knew that I was an academic. I wanted to do that first thing that to make this film that where there would be re really vetted computational data and all we had were dots on a matrix and we'd say, no, but we can make it look beautiful with computer graphics. and. And we did a mock-up, and I, I just turned my storyboards over to University of Illinois Archives. And here I am, a, a little associate professor standing up in front of the Smithsonian, uh, Harvard Smithsonian astrophysicist, and saying, no, we can make it look real. And Martin Harwit, who was the head of the Smithsonian at the time, uh, had to go check it out with in Princeton with Jeremiah Ostreicher just to make sure that this computational science was really valid stuff. And uh, so, you know, it was like a first. I wanted to be there for that, that doing that, even though Toy Story was also a first. This was really, uh, really unusual to bring art and science together in that way. Uh, and when computational science was still even being understood and validated uh, and to, to be able to, to make that leap. And so Cosmic Voyage, we got it done. Motorola, Mel Slater helped get uh, funding with the foundation. Uh, uh, Motorola put in $5 million to get this film done. It was a Smithsonian film. Um, and uh, we worked on it and developed Cosmic Voyage and then it got nominated for Academy Award. And that was its own experience. I had gone the year before with Chris Landreth, who also had been nominated, who had been in my classroom and I got invited to go the red carpet. And then that year, 
I went with the Cosmic Voyage team and Bob Patterson and I walked the red carpet and that was that was really great and uh, uh, we saw people there like Stefan Fangmeyer who was there who was nominated like with Twister and Stefan had been working at NCSA at one time and I recognized the little round circles from the Twister, you know, we did that in the 1989 data-driven thunderstorm, you know, <laughs> and here it was showing up in the movie Twister. So we saw, you know, we said, hi, you know, Stefan. I was so lucky to be at Industrial Light and Magic and work with Stefan on Twister, and then also to work with him uh, a couple of years oh, later really? on The Perfect Storm. Oh, that um, is so great. And you, you, also, you also worked with Jeff Yost, who, oh, yeah. who was at Industrial Light and Magic, and I believe he's still there, as one of the amazing R&D folks. Stefan was nominated for two Oscars for, for Twister and for Perfect Storm. Oh, wow. And then uh, Jeff Yost also won two technical Oscars, one for developing the fur from Jumanji and another for developing oh, the wow. Xeno system at Industrial Light and Magic. So. Um, it was it was great when you you showed a, a, a picture of Stefan in your uh, in your presentation. I go, I, I know him. I, I yeah, him. yeah. And Jeff Yost is off to the side of that photo too. Yeah, so, yeah. He's in that photo too. So uh, yeah, I, yeah. And that I was kind of cool for me personally see, seeing both of those guys from. Uh, I, I got to tell you a little story. So Jeff Yost, I I get this note and he says, I've got this trophy from 1989. My parents have been holding it for years now, and so they're going to send it to you. So uh, this big trophy shows up, and I just also sent that off to the University of Illinois Archives. So Jeff saving the trophy from the visualization group that went to his parents. They stored it for years. It came to me. I stored it for years, and now it's at the University of Illinois Archives. Oh. I'm sure Jeff will be happy that it, uh, it, it's in its final resting place and uh, for for the world to see. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's so cool. You did so many deep space visualizations. Was there one that was the most fun to work on or, or out of all the things in your career? What was the most fun you had working on a project? Oh, you know, uh, this came up with our visualization group just last week um, when we were talking about, you know, what do you remember the most? How, what, what is it? Uh, it had to be Hubble 3D for, I think, Bob and me and another member or two. Um, working with Tony Myers, the late Tony Myers, was a wonderful experience. She was a great director and uh, we went to film so we had I have all this film I mean you know the next IMAX film we did a beautiful planet we it was all digital you know but we went to film on Hubble 3d and it was just we didn't have much time in fact I've got film right here that I have in that uh, from Hubble 3D. Oh, look at that. Hold, hold it up to the camera. Hold it closer to the camera. Yes, the uh, you, it's it's a film in between sandwich between plexi and um, two of the shots uh, from that uh, particular movie, a flight to Orion that had never been done before in stereo and uh uh the large scale universe and uh uh and leonardo dicaprio narrated it and he had an impact on the script and it comes back to earth at the end and it was just great working with that team that was the most fun team and yet we worked around the clock we never got a weekend off for six months no holidays off we worked right through Christmas Eve. We got Christmas Day off. We walked out of the, the door when we handed off the shots on New Year's Eve morning, and it was a blue moon, and once in a blue moon, and we worked our buns off 
on that movie, but it was such a great experience with the team and what we were doing that, again, was the first. It hadn't been done. All those digitally vetted, uh, uh, data-driven shots. Well, that, that's great. And I encourage everybody to go to your local IMAX theater because most likely one of Donna's <laughs> works is playing there <laughs> even right now. You know, uh, and I, I just have to say that these types of science educational big screen experiences have very uh, long lives. So you know that when you've given up all those weekends, that they are, the movies are shown again and again in science centers and museums and in university IMAX theaters and they and they uh, the places license these uh, films for 20 years so they'll roll them in and roll them out like Chicago Pier has a, a, a copy of Hubble 3D and they'll roll it out and they'll play it you know here and uh, every now and then so. They have a long lifespan, and that also makes me feel good about the work that we've done. It, they're more of masterpieces that last a long time. Um, and But that's true now with all the works. They're really getting everything you do has lots of long legs, and the way they're, uh, the, the, the corporations are milking them for every little replay I mean, there was a shortage of things to watch during COVID. Can you believe that? This is going to go up on YouTube. It's going to live there forever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's really amazing how things have changed. So, you know, you've worked with um, so many famous people. Tell us who you've met in your career and, and tell us who, like, was the most amazing famous person that you've ever met and, and worked with. Well... By far, uh, Jimmy Carter. That was, um, I was the first uh, uh, woman keynote presenter at Educom in 1990. And I was the opening act for Jimmy Carter. So I got to hang out with him behind stage with all of his bodyguards. And um, he went around and talked to people, but he actually came back and we had really a connection about uh, the convergence of art and science, of engineering and art through computer graphics. And he said, my, my daughter's an artist, my son's an engineer, and you know, but they, you can see the crossover. And, and so we had this real deep, you know, connection about visualization and it being a bridge between the arts and the sciences. And then he went out on stage and he gave this amazing presentation. I'm, I'm getting chills right now <laughs> because again, he's one of these people who could see the future and is so kind and thoughtful and uh, genuine. He was too genuine to be a president. So, you know, but he, uh, he really impressed me. And I'll always take that memory of him with me uh, wherever I go and his inspiration. And um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, you know, George Lucas, lots of people. It was Steve Jobs was at was also a keynote at Educom the same year as uh, Jimmy Carter and I. But I would have to say Jimmy Carter by far impressed me the most as a human being and a leader. Well, that, that's awesome. I, you, you don't know this about me, but I, I grew up in Georgia and oh, really? I actually remember Jimmy Carter as our governor before he became president. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, and I, I did uh, get his autograph at a book signing a, a, a couple of years ago. So uh, oh, wow. um, that, that was really cool. And, and my mom was in politics back at the time, so she knew him personally back in the oh, day. Wow. I, I got to ask him, did he remember my mom? And unfortunately, he said no. But, uh, you know, I, I remember her and, and I remember her introducing me to him back when I was about 12 years old. Oh, um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, I had the cool. joy of stopping through there and uh, going to the Carter Museum. And um, definitely, I gave a talk at Emory and he is a big donor I and mean, he just 
gives of himself to the community in Georgia. He is very, very well respected there. And yeah, he's, yeah. again, That's very great, genuine. Right. And, and that was cool because I had no idea that that was going to be your answer. So uh, then that's really great. Um, now you've done now now that we're talking politics, yeah. um, you've done a lot of visualizations about climate change. Yes. And what's going on with the earth. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I'm 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 just going to. Go ahead and ask. Have have you talked to Joe Biden about this? Or, I mean, well, I wish, your yeah, visualizations. I, I too busy packing my office up. Should have given Joe a call. But uh, yeah, our latest work is definitely on climate change. Um, but we did work with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency on the satellite data, visualizing all the satellite data. Uh, the team did an amazing job of processing uh, these scans from this uh, satellite sh of the North and South Pole. Uh, and then we put it together and animated it, showing the glaciers melting. Um, and uh, it, it was really the Obama administration that, that really brought the, uh, the uh, NGA gave them credit. I mean, these are the people that located Osama bin Laden, but now they have it already in their charge, in their letter. These are the surveillance people. These are the people that can read your license plates from space. Hmm. But they know climate change is happening. They know it's a threat to global national security. They know that we need to get this data to scientists and we worked with a group at the University of Minnesota, Paul Marin and their team that have taken a lot of this data and processed it. Uh, Ian Howitt from uh, Ohio, who are really pre-processing some of the data and then we put it in motion. Again, the animated aspect of it is very powerful. And so, what our goal is, is to help communicate this, not from computational data, but from observational data from these satellites, so that there's not this um, political issue of, oh, well, these computational models can be wrong, or they can, you know, no, let's just show you the real data. Let's show you the process pictures. So that's what we've done for Atlas of a Changing Earth, ACE, Atlas of a Changing Earth, and that will be opening to full dome theaters sometime in the fall if we don't have a delta rising and taking over our, our big theaters again. But uh, that is going to be a great show. We did lots of wonderful images and they will be submitted to SIGGRAPH 2022. So we will the team will do it, of course, I won't, I won't, but the Advanced Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois will be getting those ready to go. But contacting Joe Biden didn't do it. Uh, we were prepared for that. We think that, you know, more funding is going to be coming from the president's office to the National Science Foundation that funds inst research institutes like the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. So we anticipate that there will be more funding available to do visualization of this kind of data, and we hope so. And some of the computational models that, that we visualized for Atlas of a Changing Earth, it's very clear a typical summer day could easily get up to 120 degrees. I'll just throw that out there. I'm, you know, it can, it, it's going to happen. I mean, we have done, we have got to um, pay attention. With solar superstorms, where the, the narrated by Benedict Cumberbatch, that was a full dome show, that um, NSF invited me to go to Washington, D.C., present this movie in the Senate building to legislators 
because there was a bill to be funded around space weather. And at the time, this was 2016. And at the time, a lot of the legislators just didn't understand what geoscience was. They thought it was climate change. They were going to pull funding for some things that they didn't, they found questionable, but really that funding bill was for space weather. And we've got to pay attention to that kind of science as well. I mean, what ha we're very connected. And what happens on this in the sun is affecting our power grids and our satellite communications here on Earth. So being able to predict space weather, just like we predict hurricanes and tornadoes, is very important to the survival of human beings. And so Solar Superstorms was a full dome show, museum show, that really explained the connection between uh, coronal mass ejections and space weather and how it affects people. And the bill, it helped the bill to get funding. The next week, the Senate passed the bill, and within two years, the House had, after some changes, but we got funding for science on space weather through the entire story of solar storms. And that's data in context. Visualizations wrapped around a story and in context is, is really the AVL's forte. And, and the fact that you got legislation passed in 2018, we all, we all know what the administration was in 2018. So that's freaking amazing. <laughs> and, and on behalf of the world, I thank you. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we have another question here from one of our pioneers. How do artists' understanding of visual perception improve or make possible scientific visualizations? I guess, I guess the question is kind of how do you as an artist turn the data into something visual and, and understandable? Yeah, so numerical data and, and uh, let me go back to the term artist. Artist is a, an umbrella term that really includes design, art and design. I'm a professor in art and design. And so design is driven by problem solving. You know, you define what the problem is. So design of information is really what my professorship was. So taking numerical information and designing that, coming up with glyphs or ways of representing. And I work in a team, and so there's parts of that. There's the processing of the data, there's the getting the, the, the data like into Houdini, uh, there's uh, like Kalina would write the plugin and uh, AJ and Bob would set up the Houdini files and so it's a team effort where it really is, first of all, you try to understand what you're trying to communicate. You make sure the science is right. You take the data, it's full of artifacts, it's full of problems, and then you start iterating on it to satisfy how are you gonna communicate it? What's the important feature that we're trying to extract here? And then how do you make the camera path, how do you select the color scale driven by data? How do you uh, uh, use the computer graphics tools to provide the context and to the setting for this data? And so it is, uh, it's a very complex process and it's iterative. And so some of the experiments that we try just simply don't work or they communicate the wrong thing. And our cadence project, which was funded by NSF, gave us money to test audiences on what they saw and what they understand and what their takeaway was and their interpretation. So that we were testing our own visualizations to make sure that the data was speaking accurately and that we were using verbal metaphors 
as well as visual metaphors to correctly communicate the science behind the data. Do you have a project that you would say was like one of the most difficult projects to actually visualize? Absolutely. Some of the most abstract stuff is, is quantum physics, and uh, it's hard to relate. I mean, when you think of what that really means, um, there's so little reference. So like with the tornado, you can bootstrap an idea, you can take and you can see wheat blowing in a field, and then you can develop a computer graphics glyph to show wind and direction and speed because you've got a reference point. But with quantum physics, there's no reference point uh, with action at a distance and, and some of the behaviors of subatomic uh, phenomenon. So I would say by far uh, issues around numerical relativities, singularities, certain, you know, we, there's an attempt to create metaphors to show that stuff. But we did have a great experience working with Andrea Goetz, who's now a Nobel, who's won the Nobel Prize for her looking and studying stars that go around the black hole in the, in the center of the Milky Way. And we worked with her data. But again, we're not actually showing the black hole. We're showing the effects of the black hole. So the stars become the visual metaphor for that. This is your retirement party. Yeah. Right? You're, you, you and Bob both are retiring or have retired two days ago. Two days. <laughs> I guess the question would be... Plans, plans after, after <laughs> retirement. <laughs> That's easier for me to say for Bob than myself. Bob will be doing more music, and I say that I will be getting back to um, hand tactile art, which is something that I've missed with computer graphics, um, because I was a, a tactile hands-on artist prior to... to uh, starting to com uh, program computers. But um, I do think that I'm going to do a lot more reading and a lot more meditation and a lot more travel, for sure. I think those three things are gonna rise, be the first. And then I have a book project that I'm working on. I really do love the history project at the archives to capture a lot of the history of the early days of the NCSA and the University of Illinois. That's one of the things that I've tried to um, move the pioneers in a direction of is thinking about archiving because it's not just you and the University of Illinois. It's every pioneer, every SIGGRAPH pioneer out exactly. there has stuff exactly. that needs to be archived. And, and that's why we've uh, uh, we've worked with the Charles Babbage Institute, uh, Amanda yep. Wick over there, and um, and Joan Collins, I know, is very active in the Los Angeles area of trying to get archiving uh, from some of the companies and people and, uh, and you know, projects over the years. So um, I'm happy to hear you're going to be doing that, but, but I'm sad to hear that of, of those three things, none of them has to do with doing any more production work. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, uh, the, the deadline driven Donna is uh, how I used to sign my emails. Um, and my daughter Elizabeth really wants to spend more time with me. So I'm trying to stay away from things where there's another person's deadline for me and the, that they're more self-imposed or at least family-imposed deadlines uh, rather than, than the production deadlines. But definitely Bob and I have lived under the production deadlines for many years now. And I, I understand this so much. That's why I pulled myself out of the movie business uh, um, a decade or two ago and, and said, I'm done with 
having to stay late because somebody needs to see this shot on their desk, you know, in dailies tomorrow morning. Um, so I, I totally get it. And I'm looking forward to a time where I can do the same thing. So our time is running short. I want to ask you this. Is there a question that you've always wished somebody would ask you that no nobody's ever asked you and 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 where where would you go with like what what would you like to tell us in in concluding with your uh, pioneers interview uh, this evening you know i think i've really said most of it and i'll come back to the people uh, when i when I look back on the history, um, and uh, you know, it's it's remembering the people and the great times, and uh, I also, you know, probably made a lot of enemies along the way. Maybe part of that is to say sorry about that. It was twenty years ago, but um, but really it's it's really touching base with the people again and even giving this pioneers you know preparing the presentation uh, I've reached out to an, a, a number of people to say goodbye in terms of retirement and I think that that's the best thing you know about the pioneers event it's really connecting back to the people and our history because we all are we're and are interconnected. And the history of SIGGRAPH, like, um, and the people who helped build it up, like, uh, you know, Tom DeFonte and other colleagues, uh, and Larry Smarr, I mean, it's, it's the people, Ellen Sandor, and um, all the women in the book. I mean, that was, it's connecting to the people. Yes, they did these phenomenal things, but when you really think about it, it was the quality of their being and doing those things together that that really makes it all worthwhile to look back. Bringing a tear to my eye, Donna. <laughs> and absolutely, it's always all about the people when you look back. I'm going to uh, ask our moderator, Brian, time to start bringing people in let everybody kind of wave and do a little group picture of everybody. <laughs> so if you want to be part of this, turn on your camera and Brian and I will be promoting everybody from attendee to panelist. Turn on your mics and, uh, and your uh, cameras and Lou Harrison and Brian Sanchez are going to start admitting people. And thank you to Lou and Brian and to uh, Jenna Feldman, who's been behind the scenes uh, helping with this Zoom meeting. And thank you to SIGGRAPH. Thank you to the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, um, our parent organization. And there's Bob. Hey. There's Bob. You know, can we turn can we turn on Bob's microphone and and Hello. let him say a few words? Because you're so integral to everything that Donna has just been talking about. Well, it's great to see you, Ed. And thank you so much for uh, putting this together. And I know Donna put a lot of effort into the presentation and, uh, and tried to capture a lot of history and all that. We've loved SIGGRAPH, okay? Let's just put that out there. We love SIGGRAPH. And hey, George, we, we really love seeing, especially in the pioneers, uh, hey, Jeff, uh, seeing everybody. You know, that's such a big thing about SIGGRAPH, seeing everybody and sharing Bonnie. all the cool things. Hey, Bonnie, all the cool things that you've done uh, in the last year. And uh, even though we're both retiring, we've we've really been working intensively over this like last year and a half, all through COVID. We haven't had like a vacation day. So it's like, finally, we're gonna get a vacation. We do hope to submit a number of pieces. I think the team will, and uh, hopefully we'll all be in person. I think we'll come to Vancouver. Uh, we'd love to see you all again in person. Virtual reality was uh, was really, I think, ahead of its time. We, we were lucky that NCSA had the cave and we used it. We used it as a production tool. I actually, I had tendonitis from working a year at, at ILM, uh, <laughs> doing this morphing commercial, just like burned up my wrist. So I got into voice recognition and we did this voice driven cave application for doing God. camera choreography. And, uh, and that was exciting. 
to be able to push the Hi. envelope and contribute. Anyway, I shouldn't talk anymore. We've had a great time. And, uh, and I know walking through SIGGRAPH with Donna is like, you can't get very far because it stops along the way, but that's what's so great. Anyway, great, uh, great Thanks, to see Bob. you all. It is oh, so looking. great, Pete. It's so great to see all of you. I love this. Hey, Larry. I love this. This is like a who's who of CGI. This is amazing. The, 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 the <laughs> people that are just on my screen right now, it's, it's wonderful. Ed Angel is out there. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. guys. Thanks for oh, joining great. us. And George. thank you, Donna. This oh, has been a thank wonderful Thank you, everybody, treat. for being here.